Well, it's my pleasure now to discuss uh, the role of mTOR and mTOR inhibition in uh, neuroendocrine tumors. So this is an area that's uh, seeing some advances. And uh, our, 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 I think we are encouraged to use some audience response system to, um, in our talk. So I, I made up this question here. And the question is, what is the rationale for use of mTOR inhibitors in neuroendocrine tumors? Uh, all, all these are true with the exception of one. Uh, the one is mutation in mTOR gene among patients with, pain, uh, with neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, number two, genetic cancer syndrome uh, involving mTOR pathway predisposed patients to neuroendocrine tumors. Number three, low expression of TSC2 or tuberous sclerosis uh, 2 gene is associated with a poor uh, prognosis among patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. And number four, low expression of P10 is associated with poor prognosis with, uh, among patients with neuroendocrine tumors. So the question is, which of these four statements is not correct? Uh, if you would vote. Okay. So I think we'll come back to this uh, at the end of the presentation. Most people voted for one there. Great. So. Uh, mTOR will target rapamycin as an evolutionary uh, conserved serine screening kinase that we inherit all the way back to the days of single cellular organisms. In single cellular organisms, TOR will target rapamycin mostly respond to uh, nutrient signaling. When there's a lot of nutrient uh, energy in the environment, the TOR pathway is turned on, that leads to cell growth and proliferation, and allows the cells to make protein. Uh, when there's a starvation condition, the TOR pathway is turned off. This leads to autophagy, which means that the cell actually breaks down the ribosomes for energy metabolism and goes into a fairly dormant state. There are actually no known mutations in, in mTOR in terms of uh, in human cancers, but this regulation of the pathway is fairly common. Uh, Everolimus is a uh, orally available uh, mTOR inhibitor that binds to FK binding protein 12 and then in turn inhibit the, the TOR pathway. We got interested in uh, the TOR pathway or, uh, for neuroendocrine tumors because uh, a patient very much like this one, a patient with subependymal giant cell astrocytoma, uh, panc pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, and angiolyomypoma. For those of you who are aficionados of uh, of a genetic cancer syndrome. This is a patient with tuberous sclerosis. So the TSC12 gene complex is our body's endogenous inhibitor of mTOR. And study of normal panc uh, pancreatic islet cell shows that, that uh, these, these, these genes are normally intact and expressed. When the, when the gene is mutated and not expressed, there's an increased risk for the development of neuroendocrine tumors, as in this case. In fact, a number of other genetic cancer syndromes that involve the mTOR pathway are also associated with development of neuroendocrine tumors. This actually includes the von Hippel-Lindau syndrome as well as neurofibromatosis, uh, F1. And actually even MEM1 uh, with, a, uh, with a menin gene uh, interact with the mTOR pathway probably through P27. There are also some data suggesting that uh, in this presentation that was made at ACR uh, uh, a, about a year ago, or two years ago, that uh, the that genetic polymorphism in the TSE2 gene may actually increase the risk of development of, uh, uh, of carcinoid tumors, or small bowel carcinoid tumors. Also, there's this data that was uh, done uh, in patients with pan uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors showing that uh, low expression of TSC2 and P10, so genes involved in the mTOR pathway, are actually associated with prognosis among patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Those patients with low expression TSC2 or P10 have uh, shorter progression-free survival and shorter overall survival. Uh, this led us to do a phase two study uh, back, which we opened back in 2005, actually, uh, where we treated the first patient, uh, with Everolimus plus Alctrotide LAR. In this study, 
we treated a total of 60 patients, 30 carcinoid tumors, and 30 islet cell tumors. And what we demonstrated here among these patients who are relatively early in their course of disease, uh, there was an intent to treat response rate of 20%, which is uh, fairly promising in this group of patients uh, with you know, disease that are fairly refractory to standard therapy. Uh, with this, uh, the Novartis began a development program called Radiant, uh, which uh, looked at uh, fairly thoroughly assessed uh, everolemus in neuroendocrine tumors. Radiant 1 took uh, everolemus into a tougher uh, patient population. In this study, a total of 160 patients with chemotherapy, uh, uh, previously treated with chemotherapy, and uh, have disease progression. So they had to have progression either during chemotherapy or after chemotherapy. Uh, uh, these patients were treated with everolemus. What we demonstrated here is among these patients with refractory and progressive disease, everolemus has potentially uh, potential to uh, stabilize these tumors and uh, stop tumor growth. In, this, in, the, in the patient receiving everolemus, in this cohort of patients receiving everolemus, median progression-free survival was 9.7 months. For the patients uh, who uh, were on octreotide LAR uh, prior to study entry, perhaps for the control of hormonal syndromes, uh, and they received the combination of everolemus and octreotide LAR, and the median progression-free survival here was 16.7 months. Again, uh, this is a stratified study, not a randomized uh, study. Uh, from these two earlier studies, we also uh, had some hints that this class of drug may have some very special activity in a, in a class of uh, uh, tumors called insulinomas. So this is actually the very first description of an insulinoma that was published in, uh, in JAMA back in 1927. The patient is an orthopedic surgeon called Dr. Willock and uh, encloses the referral note from his referring physician to the Mayo Clinic, which described a fairly classic uh, uh, presentation of a patient with a malignant insonoma. Uh, the patient was described to resemble an acute alcoholic with great uh, motor activity, dancing, talking, and having hallucinations. And after uh, the doctor gave him a Coca-Cola full of sugar and syrup, uh, the patient uh, recovered in about uh, five minutes. Uh, the patient was later uh, taken to the operating uh, room by Dr. Will Mayo of Mayo Clinic and was found to have uh, a, a he's, he was found to have a pancreas uh, that had a consistency uh, that was hard and irregular and a metastasis the size of an orange in the right lobe of the liver. In fact, uh, some later authors have uh, speculated, actually, in fact, this patient may, may well have had a uh, uh, MEM1. Uh, nonetheless, the patient did very poorly after surgery, required constant oral glucose and IV infusion, and died without leaving the hospital. So until recently, we don't actually do much better than this. Patient with refractory hypoglycemia are among the hardest patients for us to manage and often can be in our hospital and in the ICU for months at a time. Uh, in our earlier study with Everolemus, we treated a total of four patients, two at MD Anderson, one at the Infarber, and one at UCSF. And what we saw is among these patients with refractory hypoglycemia, all four patients quickly normalized their blood sugar and were able to discontinue their other uh, measures for control of glucose. Two of the patients also experienced uh, tumor shrinkage as well. So why is, why is this? And this also gives us some clue as to why perhaps everolemus may cause some problems with hyperglycemia. For this, we go back to the uh, diabetes literature and we show that, uh, in fact, the mTOR is involved in insulin uh, uh, receptor signaling. And uh, tissue-specific knockout of insulin receptor in the beta cells uh, causes the loss of glucose-stimulated uh, release of insulin. And insulin essentially stimulates its own release, gene transcription, and DNA synthesis. And this pathway is going through uh, the mTOR. And what we show here is that there are two papers uh, that are showing that if you stimulate the uh, islets with uh, sugar or insulin, 
there is the increase in these uh, in pre pro uh, insulin mRNA synthesis, and also there is increase in DNA synthesis. And if you inhibit mTOR pathway with uh, rapamycin analogs, uh, you can uh, actually abort this process. So why is it this, uh, that our body have a, a positive feedback loop around the insulin receptor? I think we have to, for this, we have to remember that normally uh, these beta cells in the intact islets are in the center of the islets, and there are other cells that normally shut this down uh, when the uh, uh, when the insulin pr production is, is sufficient. And this positive feedback loop then allow us to push out a lot of insulin in a short period of time in response to a large, heavy meal. Uh, this takes us to the uh, two uh, randomized phase three pivotal studies with Everolimus that has been recently reported uh, at ESMO. Uh, the first study I'm going to uh, discuss, the Radiant 3 study, uh, which uh, had its results uh, uh, unblinded first. Uh, Radian 3 is a double-blind uh, double placebo-controlled uh, study of Everolimus plus best supportive care versus placebo plus best supportive care uh, among patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors who have had disease progression within the past 12 months. The study uh, randomized a total of 410 patients uh, be between August of 2007 and May of 2009. Here are the patient characteristics. Uh, randomization resulted in 207 patients receiving, uh, going into the Everolimus arm and 203 patients going into the placebo arm. The two groups were well balanced with respect to age, gender performance status, and histologic grade. The two groups were also well balanced by prior anti-cancer therapy. Uh, 49 and 50 percent of the patients have, uh, have had prior somatostatin analogs, and 50 percent of uh, patients uh, have had uh, prior chemotherapy in this group. So unlike the previous study, uh, this study did not require a failure of prior chemotherapy uh, for, for entry. In terms of patient uh, disposition, uh, disposition, at the time of the analysis, 32% of the patients in the Everolimus arm and 13% uh, of the patients in the placebo arm remain in active ther therapy. The most common reason for study discontinuation was disease progression, which occurred uh, in 80% of patients in the placebo arm and 44% of patients in the um, uh, Everolimus arm. The duration of drug exposure was significantly longer in the Everolimus arm, uh, 38 weeks versus 16 weeks in the placebo arm. This study allowed a uh, patient who uh, progressed during the study treatment to be unblinded and switched over uh, from the uh, placebo arm to Everolimus if they were on placebo uh, in, a, uh, in a planned crossover design. Indeed, 148 patients, essentially 70 uh, percent of the patient in the placebo arm, or 91 percent of all patients on the placebo arm who have had disease progression, did indeed cross over from the placebo arm to the Everolimus arm. Here's the data uh, for the primary analysis, which is progression-free survival uh, by investigator review. Uh, Everolimus therapy was uh, associated with a 6.4 months improvement in progression-free survival. The median PFS for the Everolimus arm was 11 months, and this was 4.6 months in the placebo arm. This corresponds to a hazard ratio of 0 .6, uh, 0 0.35, or a 65% reduction in the risk of, production, uh, in the risk of uh, progression among patients receiving Everolimus. The, uh, the p-value was uh, highly significant, uh, at less than 0 0.0001. Uh, you can see here that uh, the progression-free survival rate at 18 months was also uh, show significant benefit for Everolimus. 34% of patients remained uh, alive and progression-free at 18 months in the Everolimus arm versus 8.9% on the placebo arm. 
including the study, also was a central radiology review uh, as a sensitivity analysis. And this showed uh, results that are very similar and supportive of the investigator review. Median PFS was 11.4 months for the Everolimus arm and 5.4 months for the placebo arm. Hazard ratio and p-value, again, are very similar and highly statistically significant. Subgroup analysis was performed here to assess the homogeneity of uh, treatment effect. As you can see here, uh, there was benefit seen, robust benefit seen across all, group, uh, all, all groups, regardless of prior chemotherapy, performance status, age, gender, and uh, prior therapy, or uh, tumor grade. Here we have the resist response uh, profile for the uh, patients uh, in the two arms. What we see here is that the response rate is actually uh, fairly low, uh, as with most uh, targeted agents. Ten patients uh, have had a confirmed partial response in the Everolimus arm, comparing to uh, uh, four in the placebo arm. And um, uh, the b big difference, however, is the number of patients uh, having their disease stabilized. Uh, these patients with progressive disease, uh, which was 72.9% uh, versus 50.7%. In another word, 14% uh, of patients had progressive disease as best response in the Everolimus arm, comparing to 41.9% uh, in the placebo arm. This is a significant difference in terms of response profile between the two arms, benef uh, showing benefit for Everolimus. Another way, however, as mentioned uh, earlier, that you know, resist response rate may not be the best way to assess uh, a response. Another way to look at response as a continuous parameter is the use of what we call waterfall plots. In these plots, what we're plotting here is best percentage change in terms of resist tumor measurements uh, uh, among these patients. The patients in blue experienced tumor shrinkage or stabilization as best outcome, and the patients in yellow experienced tumor growth as the best out outcome. As you can see, even from the back of the room, you can see there are more patients experiencing stabilization with tumor shrinkage in the Everolimus arm. Uh, overall survival, uh, we did not see a significant difference in overall survival at the time of this analysis. However, uh, this, uh, this analysis is still quite early. The number of events uh, has not been reached for the final analysis. Uh, also to keep in mind, given that, uh, you know, 70% of patients on the placebo arm or 91% of those patients receive, uh, on the placebo arm who had disease progression cross over to receive open-label Everolimus, uh, it is unlikely, I think, we will see a survival uh, difference between the two arms. In terms of adverse events, uh, treatment, I think, was uh, fairly well tolerated. The most common adverse events was stomatitis, which actually, in this case, is like aphus ulceration, uh, canker source that comes and goes. O other common adverse events includes rash and uh, diarrhea and fatigue. But as you can see here, that the number of uh, grade three, four adverse events uh, in, in, with treatment is actually uh, fairly, uh, fairly low, uh, suggesting the treatment are actually fairly well tolerated. In summary, uh, Everolimus uh, in the Radiant 3 st uh, st uh, study, which uh, examined its activity in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, provided uh, a 65% risk reduction for progression in, compared to placebo. Uh, Everolimus therapy uh, resulted in a significant uh, 6.4 uh, months increase in PFS. 18 months uh, progression-free survival rate demonstrate that these benefits are fairly durable. And uh, there was a consistent uh, benefit seen in the subgroup analysis, and Everolimus had an acceptable safety profile similar to what was demonstrated before in the renal cell study. So rating three is the largest uh, randomized study ever completing pancreatic nets. Uh, treatment with Everolimus uh, was associated with a 2.4-fold increase in median progression-free survival. And I think we can now add Everolimus as a part of the standard of care uh, options 
for patients with advanced pancreatic NADs. Next, I'm going to go into a parallel study, uh, the RADIN-2 study. RADIN-2 uh, is a similar study to RADIN-3, but conducted among patients with uh, uh, neuroendocrine tumors who have had a history of carcinoid syndrome. RADIN-2 is a double-blind placebo-controlled study that compa compare everolimus plus octreotide LAR to placebo plus octreotide LAR. Similar to the RADIN-3 study, all patients had had evidence of disease progression within the past 12 months. Also, patients were allowed to cross over uh, from the placebo arm to everolimus at a time of progression in this study. The primary endpoint in the RADIAN2 study was progression-free survival. The study was powerful uh, for a, to detect a 33% risk reduction, or a hazard ratio of 0 0.67. Uh, 287 events were needed for 92% power. Uh, due to, however, loss of events in the central radiology review, the study was amended to have a fixed uh, data cut day uh, for final analysis. At the time of final analysis, we had 223 central events or 84% power. Randomization uh, uh, placed the 216 patients in the everolimus arm and 213 patients in the placebo arm. However, unlike the RADIAN3 study, randomization here resulted in some imbalances which favored the placebo arm and put worse prognosis patients into the everolimus arm. As you can see here, there were more patients with uh, worse uh, performance status in the everolimus arm compared to the placebo arm. And there were three times as many patients with lung primaries in the everolimus arm as uh, there were in the placebo arm. In terms of prior therapy, these groups were relatively well balanced in terms of prior uh, uh, use of semastian analogs, but there were more patients who have had prior cytotoxic chemotherapy in the everolimus arm comparing to the placebo arm. Uh, in terms of patient disposition at the time of the final analysis, uh, 16 and 17 percent of the patients in each arm remain on study uh, at the time of final analysis. Uh, this means that study was fairly mature at the time of analysis. Disease progression, again, was the most common reason for, for, study, uh, for discontinuation. Uh, this was 68.5% in the placebo arm and 44% in the uh, everolimus arm. Uh, other common uh, reason for study con discontinuation included adverse events. And we can see here that similar to the RADIAN-3 study, a significant number of patients with progression on the placebo arm did in fact cross over to receive open-label everolimus at the time of progression. Uh, here's the data for the primary analysis, which is progression-free survival by central radiology review. The treatment with everolimus was associated with a 5.1 month prolongation in progression-free survival. Uh, the median PFS for the Everolimus plus octreotide LAR, uh, LAR arm was 16.4 months compared to 11.3 months for the placebo plus octreotide LAR arm. Uh, this corresponded to a hazard ratio of 0 0.77, and, uh, which means there was a 23% risk reduction uh, in terms of the risk for progression. The p-value here was 0 0.026 which just missed the pre-specified uh, superiority boundary of 0 0.0246. Here's the similar data for the investigator-reviewed uh, progression-free survival. Uh, the hazard ratio here is quite similar to the central radiology review, but the p-value is below the pre-specified boundary for superiority at 0 0.018. And here's the subgroup analysis, again, performed to assess the homogeneity of treatment effect. Again, uh, similar to the RADIAN-3 study, we see that uh, in all subgroup, there were uh, evidence of benefit uh, favoring uh, Everlimus. However, I also want to point out to here, uh, we stated earlier, randomization uh, resulted in more patients 
with uh, performance tests one, two in the Everolimus arm, and these patients indeed had a shorter progression-free survival when exposed to placebo or observed. Similarly, there were three times as many patients with lung primary in the Everolimus arm, and indeed these are worse prognosis patients was meeting PFS in the 5.6 months range comparing to 11 to 14 months for other primary sites. Uh, I think a very similar story here. There were more patients uh, with prior exposure to chemotherapy, uh, which is a group with a worse prognosis uh, comparing to the, those who have not. So if we compare the data for the local and central uh, review of uh, uh, progression-free survival on this slide, what we see here is that the, actually the, the hazard ratio or risk, risk, risk reduction observed between the two analyses are quite similar at 0 0.78 for the central uh, local review and 0 0.77 in the central review. The difference uh, in the p-value of 0 0.018 and 0 0.026 is mainly due to the fact, I think, that in the local review there were 50 more events where it's better powered uh, analysis compared to the central review. One other thing I want to point out here is that the central radiology review in this study uh, uh, reported a longer progression-free survival for Everolimus and the placebo uh, arm relative to the uh, local review. So this is really a little bit odd because usually we think of central review as being a little bit uh, more conservative. So what's going on here? So this, in fact, is the hallmark of what we see with informative censoring. So what is informative censoring? Informative censoring occurs uh, mostly in this type of studies when uh, there's the treatment decision is made by the local oncologist, but the, the central review uh, is, is being used to derive an endpoint. What happened is that the patient who has progressed the disease by investigator who the central radiologists felt like did not reach criteria for uh, progressive disease. Uh, these patients' treatment were switched by the investigator, and then they were censored in the central analysis. So what happens here is that, although we usually think of central review as something that's independent, the central review actually is actually very dependent upon the treatment decision made by the local investigator. So let's take a closer look at informative censoring and what the problem uh, poses to uh, these type of study using central radiology review. So first, uh, we have to understand that uh, progression-free survival by radiology is always a, a estimate because real progression in the patients occur, uh, can occur any time along these timelines. Uh, and we are doing CT scans for MRIs um, at fixed intervals. So when we do a study with central radiology review, in fact, there are two estimates for every patient in terms of the progression-free survival. There's actually no problem if the local and central uh, re agree when the progression occurred, or if the uh, central radiologist calls progression uh, earlier. The problem occurs when the local uh, person this uh, calls progression before the central, uh, central uh, radiologist. In this scenario, what happens is that because the patient's treatment is switched, no, for, no further uh, scan or data is made available to the central uh, radiologist, and the patient becomes informatively censored. So the net effect of this is that you're preventing the central radiologist from seeing the progression events which caused the central analysis to have a longer PFS, inflation of PFS, redu and reduced power. The problem for these sort of analysis is that informative censoring uh, is taking the patient's data out of analysis right before the progression occurs. This actually violates some of the uh, fundamental assumptions underlying standard survival analysis. In standard Kaplan-Meier or Cox uh, time to event analysis, we assume the event course of patients who are censored is the same as those who are remaining over, uh, under observation. So is there a way to address this issue of informative censoring? One methodology that has been used in other large studies successfully to address informative censoring, for example, in large study in HIV and breast cancer, 
is IPCW, or inverse probability of censoring weights. So the, uh, recall that our underlying problem here is that progression is both increasing the risk of having a real PFS event and also increasing the risk of patients being informatively censored. So in the IPCW analysis, we model the probability of, uh, uh, of the patient being censored at each time segment given the various covariates, both baseline and time dependent. Then weights are assigned to each patient at each time segment. The weight reflects the probability of having informative censoring. The net effect of this is that if the patient has a high risk of informative censoring but is not censored, meaning there's concordance, agreement between the local and central radiologists, this patient is given fairly high weight in the analysis. And in there, if there's informative censoring occurring, then there's lower weights in that particular time segment. What we aim to create is really to recreate the study population without the informative censoring. So the IPCW analysis will apply to the central radiology data in this study. What we showed here is the, with the IPCW analysis, the hazard ratio was 0 0.6. Uh, the progression-free survival for the Everolimus arm medium was 13.8 months versus 8.3 months in the placebo arm. And interestingly, the IPCW analysis of central radiology results uh, give us PFS estimates that are much closer to the local results. Similar to the radian, uh, radian 3 study, the most common adverse event we see here is stomatitis, uh, rash, and uh, fatigue. Uh, again, however, the rate of uh, grade 3, 4 adverse events are in the single digits, uh, meaning that most of the toxicity, I think, are, are manageable. So in summary, in the radian 2 study, Everolimus plus Octroti LAR demonstrated 5.1 months prolongation in progression-free survival. Uh, the hazard ratio was 0 0.77. The p-value did not reach the pre-planned, uh, the boundary of 0 0.0246 uh, in the central review. In the local re review, the, uh, the hazard ratio was quite similar at 0 0.78. Uh, the p-value is below the pre-specified boundary. The, uh, the IPCW analysis, which is just for informative censoring and loss of power due to informative censoring, uh, which also corrects for the imbalances in randomization, demonstrated a consistent benefit was a hazard ratio of 0 0.6. Uh, in the subgroup analysis, we saw there was benefit favoring Everolimus across all the subgroups, and the safety profile is fairly similar than uh, compared to those in other uh, studies with Everolimus. So in conclusion, uh, for patients with neuroendocrine tumors uh, in this population, there's a significant uh, unmet medical need. Uh, in the U.S., there are actually no, no drugs approved for control of tumor growth in this population. Everolimus plus Altrilia LAR demonstrated a, clini a clinically meaningful prolongation of progression-free survival, and together from the, with the data from the Radian 3 study, supports the ev uh, efficacy of Everolimus in advanced pancreatic uh, and uh, non-pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Thank you for all the investigators who uh, participated in this study. The rating program was rating 1, 2, and 3, uh, a total of 999 patients, and represents the largest development program in neuroendocrine tumors. Thanks. <laughs>